Okay. So this is chapter nine, one more time, and it's about cellular respiration and fermentation. Uh, we're gonna get to what fermentation is about. Um, and uh, you know what? So this is the first image of the animal that consumes, like eats, eats plants, right? Flowers, and uh, it actually demonstrates the flow of energy, right? So plants, they lock sunlight energy in the form of photosynthesis. Plants convert um, carbon dioxide into carbohydrates, right? So uh, starch, or in this case, to cellulose, right? Plants also, through photosynthesis, produce oxygen, which are the basic components for cellular respiration, oxygen and carbs, right? And this is a fuel, like a fuel for the engine of the car, right? This is a fuel for cells. This is a fuel for the whole entire organism. When you talk about fuel, when you talk about energy, um, you learned last lecture that energy pretty much will translate to many different venues, right? Energy to carry out metabolism, energy to move, energy to grow and develop. And don't forget, energy is also usually uh, turns into heat, right? Heat that maintains body temperature. And in this case, uh, this animal is capable of maintaining body temperature, right? Um, and uh, also heat is usually uh, lost as well into the environment, okay? That's why energy has to be renewed because, you know, it's always transformed into heat that is lost, okay, part of it. And, um, you know, let me just write the objectives for today's lecture. So I'm gonna go into the whiteboard. And um, objectives for today's class today is October 15th. Okay. And um, yeah, objectives for today will be um, cellular respiration, which could be broken down to um, reduction, reduction, then uh, components of cellular respiration, then ATP production. And the second part will be fermentation. Okay, so these are objectives for today. And uh, please let me know when I can go to PowerPoint. May I? Yes. May I go to PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. And uh, this is like a diagram pretty much of um, chemical energy that is stored in uh, form of carbs, right? that could be uh, transformed into ATP. And this is light energy. So photosynthesis, as I mentioned, generates organic molecules, carbs. 
for example, uh, oxygen consumed by uh, this animal, right? Cellular respiration will produce carbon dioxide and oxygen and carbon dioxide could be recycled through photosynthesis again, right? But at the same time, within their animal cells or plant cell as well, these components could be used to generate energy in form of ATP that pretty much is a fuel, the driving force behind their cellular uh, function. So um, let me make sure that I share the sound with you. So let's take a look at this animation. Let's look at energy flow and chemical recycling in an ecosystem, starting with photosynthesis. The ingredients for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide is obtained from the air by a plant's leaves, and water is obtained from the damp soil by a plant's roots. The chloroplasts present in the cells of leaves use energy from sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into organic molecules like glucose. The process also releases oxygen into the environment. Now let's look at cellular respiration. In eukaryotic cells, many of the steps of cellular respiration take place in mitochondria. Organic molecules and oxygen from photosynthesis are used in cellular respiration to generate ATP, which powers the work of the cell. During cellular respiration, some energy is released as heat. Carbon dioxide and water are also released as waste products. They are recycled as the raw materials for photosynthesis. Notice that in an ecosystem, energy flows in one direction, from sunlight to chemical energy and molecules to heat. In contrast, chemicals cycle between organisms and the physical environment. Yeah, so bottom line, we ultimately all get energy through the sun, right? But not directly. It's uh, picked up by plants, locked into carbohydrate molecules, right? That could be utilized by animals later on for their own energy production. So again, but indirectly, yes, we can say that we're all powered by uh, sun. And uh, remember, um, last time when we talked, we talked about uh, reactions of catabolism in anabolism, also reactions that consume energy and reactions that release energy, right? And basically, once you break down through catabolic pathway, you break down complex molecule like a glucose, right? You generate energy and this energy should be harnessed by the cell, right? And uh, cells do a really beautiful job in actually doing so um, by using, utilizing this energy in order to produce ATP, okay? And uh, this is about the catabolic pathways, right? So you can burn glucose all the way down in the process of respiration, right? Uh, when you break it all the way down, you need oxygen for that. Because you need oxygen, that's called aerobic respiration. It depends on oxygen. Um, if oxygen is not present, cells capable actually of breaking down glucose, but not all the way to small molecule. And this process is called fermentation. So usually fermentation is referred to process that oxygen is not present, while aerobic respiration is production of ATP, but it's bound to presence of oxygen. Okay. So uh, this is our, let me see like a next slide. Okay, so this is the next one. And uh, here is uh, their chemical equation of cellular respiration, which is glucose, C6H12O6, plus six molecules of oxygen, give you six molecules of carbon dioxide, and six molecules of water plus ATP. 
um, amount of ATP molecules we will discuss later on uh, today how much ATP is produced during the cellular respiration. But uh, again, if you look at this equation in the opposite direction, what do you get? If you like, from the right to left. What? This is respiration, and backwards is? Is it uh, photosynthesis or not? Absolutely, yes, this is photosynthesis. But just pay attention. Photosynthesis takes single carbons, right? Single CO2 is only one carbon atom per molecule and able to produce molecule with six carbons, right? Uh, cellular respiration takes molecule with six carbons and breaks it all the way down to single. Um, this actually liberates a lot of energy, this reaction. And cells, again, super wise in how taking it, right? Without, um, you know, without actually exploding from this huge amount of energy, okay? And you're gonna see how. Um, this is our overview, very general overview in this animation. So we can take a look and then the rest of the lectures pretty much will I'll break it down to you step by step. But this is like big picture. Electron carriers such as NADH deliver their electrons to an electron transport chain embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. The chain consists of a series of electron carriers, most of which are proteins that exist in large complexes. Electrons are transferred from one electron carrier to the... Okay, you know what? It's not a good one. <clears throat> it's not a good animation. I don't know why it's here. We didn't really get to electron chain uh, carriers, so... You know, we're probably going to watch it later. I don't know what it's doing in the beginning. Okay. Um, let's start with uh, something called redox reactions. Uh, this is the first step, reactions of oxidation and reduction. And you uh, will see why this reaction is actually central to um, cellular respiration. Um, remember, when we talked about the atomic structure, we talked about bonds, covalent bonds. Uh, covalent bonds are formed when atoms share electrons, right? So they can share electrons. And uh, because like, again, um, one atom can give electron and another one can pick it up, right? Through the process of sharing, uh, there's also something called transferring electrons. Transferring electrons is when electrons move from one atom to another one. Uh, why they move? It's a very good question, um, but capability of taking them uh, from one to another actually can release energy. And this energy, when electrons move from one atom to another could be actually utilized for the process of cellular respiration. Uh, reactions when this happens, when electrons transferred from one atom to another called oxidation reduction reactions, or sometimes they're called redox reactions. Uh, interesting terminology that might be very, very confusing. Actually, when electrons were removed, right, from the substance, that's called oxidation. When electrons are added to another atom or substance, it's called reduction. Very confusing why reduction if something is added, but um, remember electrons have a negative charge, right? When you add negative charge, you remove positive charge, right? So giving electrons oxidation, picking them up is reduction. Um, like in case of table salt, 
sodium chloride, right? Um, sodium gives away electron to chlorine, right? So sodium becomes oxidized. It gave away chlorine is removed because it gained an electron, okay? Or you can say here, uh, X with electron, right? Plus Y, X gave electron away, became oxidized, and Y picked up electron and is reduced. Any questions here? Yeah. Okay, so uh, basically the one that gives electron away is called reducing agent, right? And the one that is picking up electrons is called oxidizing agent, reducing, oxidizing. So oxidizing basically is the one that can take electrons away, right? Pick them up. Um, the best so far, the best oxidizing agent, and I think it's also like you can see oxidizing, right? Uh, kind of rings a bell about oxygen, right? So oxygen is actually the best oxidizing agent because oxygen is a very, very electronegative. If you remember that from uh, when you talked about water molecule, right? So um, oxygen is able to pull electrons to themselves, to itself, right? And when electrons transferred to oxygen, energy is released the energy of the transferring electrons from one substance to oxygen. And uh, another thing is that it not necessarily has to pull electrons, all electrons. Um, oxygen is actually capable of uh, rearranging electrons, like for example, in molecule of methane, right? So what you can see, uh, this is the methane, so CH4, right? And uh, here are the electrons that carbon shares with hydrogen, right? This is oxygen, the oxidizing agent. So basically this is a reaction of burning of methane, right? You burn methane, you get carbon dioxide, you get energy release and you get water. Uh, now pay attention in the molecule of carbon dioxide and water, what actually happened, right? So carbon transferred electrons to oxygen, right? And oxygen became reduced in the molecule of water, H2O, right? Carbon became oxidized by actually um, sharing electrons with oxygen. And we can see oxygen kind of like pulled electrons towards itself away from the molecule of carbon. So while the distance between carbon and hydrogen atoms, right, that's where the electrons are shared is more or less even. Here, what you can see, electrons are more pulled toward oxygen in this case. And in this case as well, right? One more time. Oxygen is electronegative. So it tends to pull electrons towards itself. Okay. And interestingly, when oxygen pulls electrons towards itself, it makes oxygen more, sorry, it makes uh, molecules more stable. This is less stable. This is more stable. So let's take a look here. A reduction, oxidation, redox reaction always involves two events. One substance loses electrons and is said to be oxidized, while another substance gains electrons and is said to be reduced. Sodium chloride, or table salt, offers an example of atoms that have undergone oxidation and reduction to become ions. 
When sodium and chlorine react to form sodium chloride, one electron is completely transferred from the sodium atom to the chlorine atom. The result is a sodium cation and a chloride anion. In this redox reaction, the sodium atom lost an electron. It was oxidized. The new sodium ion is a positively charged cation. The chlorine atom gained an electron. It was reduced. The new chloride ion is a negatively charged anion. In redox reactions, electrons can be transferred completely from one molecule or atom to another, forming an ionic bond, or they can simply shift positions in covalent bonds. The combustion of methane is a good example of this second type of reaction. The electrons in the two reactants, methane and oxygen, are shown as dots at equal distance from the atom's nuclei, indicating that electrons are shared equally. When electrons are shared equally, the bonds are nonpolar. Methane combustion involves the reaction of two oxygen molecules with each methane molecule. The reaction yields carbon dioxide and water as the products. The atoms in the product share electrons unequally, meaning that the bonds are polar. In carbon dioxide, the nucleus of the carbon atom holds the electrons less tightly. Carbon has been oxidized. It lost electrons. In water, the nucleus of the oxygen atom holds the electrons more tightly. Oxygen has been reduced. It gained electrons. Because the atomic nuclei of the product molecules hold the electrons more tightly than they were held in the reactant molecules, the products have lower potential energy. Such reactions tend to be spontaneous or exergonic and release free energy. A reduction oxidation. Okay, so uh, bottom line here. What he says that, sorry, um, question? Okay, so in this animation, if you paid attention one more time, so um, carbon and hydrogen here in methane, they share electrons equally. So you can see that position of electrons is pretty much um, like uh, halfway through between carbon and hydrogen, right? So which means it shares electrons through covalent bonds, right? But they only share them. Here, you pay attention in CO2 molecule and in water molecule, oxygen pulls electrons to itself, which means it's not shared evenly, right? So electrons are pulled towards oxygen, right? Here they share, and here, you know, electrons are pretty much like uh, taken by oxygen, right? And this is nonpolar, this is polar. And interestingly, nonpolar molecules hold more potential energy than polar molecules, right? And during this reaction, oxidation reduction or redox reactions, when this rearrangement of electrons happens, energy is released. Are you with me, guys? Is it clear or it's like a confusing material? It's a bit confusing. Yeah, I know. Uh, the whole idea of like, Reduction, uh, reduction is like uh, gaining positive charge. This is a, a bit, um, I don't know, weird. But uh, the whole, again, listen. When electrons transferred from one atom substance to another one, and what you can see transfer, right? So transfer, from carbon to um, towards the oxygen, right? So oxygen kind of like holds the position of them. Um, this is uh, pretty much the major idea in the whole process of cellular respiration, electron transfer, oxidation, reduction. 
Okay. Um, and as I mentioned, so during this process, the fuel molecules, fuel molecules, usually molecules that have a lot of bonds between carbon and hydrogen, and fuel molecules could be carbs, fuel molecules could be fats. Okay, and what happens, these fuel molecules get oxidized and oxygen is reduced. That's why you need this two parts for cellular respiration. For example, carbs and oxygen. And, um, and this is kind of a summary. So cellular respiration is a redox process. Energy released when um, hydrogen and electrons. Why hydrogen? Hydrogen is the easiest, easiest atom because it has one electron, right? One electron, one proton. So it's very easy to take uh, electrons from the hydrogen. Okay, so what you can see here, glucose is oxidized, right? To six CO2 molecules and oxygen is reduced to water. Okay, so um, now you can't during cellular respiration just kind of like pull this, like take this hydrogen atoms away from the glucose molecule and uh, take the electrons and transfer them. So it's pretty much uh, multi-level process and where the oxidation reduction reactions, redox reactions happen actually in multiple steps. Um, now, one more time, hydrogen has electron and if you remove electron from hydrogen, you left with a proton. Let me just draw it to you. So remember, hydrogen has one proton, one neutron, and one electron, right? So if you take electron away from hydrogen, you left with their one proton, right? So sometimes when you look at this H+, plus, it could be referred as proton. It makes a lot of sense. It's really one proton, right? And this electron, remember, in hydrogen can easily pick it up because it's only one, right? And remember, it has only one um, electron shell. So that's why whenever you see a proton, it's pretty much referred to hydrogen without electron. Okay, and um, now, so you remove electrons that transfer, usually travel with a proton, and um, as I said, you can do it directly from hydrogen to oxygen. Uh, so there are special carriers, carriers that can do this job. And please meet the first one. It's called uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or NAD plus, okay? This is a coenzyme which means it's not organic molecule, right? And it's a carrier and nothing more than just electron carrier. So as you can see, it has a positively, it's positively charged, right? So quite often what happens, um, it's yet oxidized, right? So it picks up oxygen, uh, it picks up electron along with the proton, right? And turns from NAD plus to NADH, okay? And it's, it's literally a carrier. So which means that it gives, picks up and transfers to another molecule, nothing more than that, okay? Electron acceptor, oxidizing agent, NAD plus, to an ADH. Um, now, it doesn't do it on its own. There is an enzyme 
um, enzymes called dehydrogenases, right? Dehydrogenases, they can uh, remove the pair of atoms, right? Along with the electrons and protons from the substrate and then transfer to NAD+, okay? And usually when it's transferred to NAD+, it turns to NADH plus another hydrogen ion, okay? So what you can see here uh, is one more time. You see this is our NAD+, right? It picks up two hydrogen atoms from food, right? So enzyme called dehydrogenase, move them to NAD plus molecule, and it turns to NADH plus hydrogen ion, okay? NAD plus plus two hydrogen atoms. NAD plus will pick up two electrons, right? One hydrogen proton, and here's another hydrogen proton. So again, uh, without going too much into details, just look at this molecule, NAD plus, as a molecule that is capable of picking up electrons and transferring them to another molecule, okay? It doesn't do that on its own. There's an enzyme that facilitates the whole process. That's what you can see here. Um, this is um, whatever carbon can be, right? The hydrogenase and two hydrogen um, removed. One is bound to an AD plus and another one as a proton. Are you with me so far? Talk to me guys. Um. I'm confused on the dehydrogenase, but the fact that I got everything else. Okay, dehydrogenase is just an enzyme. Remember, we talked about enzymes last class, right? Uh, enzymes are catalysts that pretty much conduct chemical reactions. If you remember, they hover active site where substrate binds uh -huh. to, right? And that's where they actually can do different things, depends on the enzyme. What the hydrogenase can do, it can just pick up electrons from here and put them on NADH plus, okay? But isn't NAD plus also a coenzyme? It is a coenzyme on its own, right? It's a coenzyme. But mm -hmm. to transfer electrons on this coenzyme, you need another enzyme. Oh, okay. Okay. which is the hydrogenase, okay? Okay. More questions, guys? Okay. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, so the whole process of transferring electrons, it takes steps. So it goes step by step. Um, because actually if, as it, uh, as it said here, if, NADH will pick up these electrons and like transfer them directly to oxygen, the whole thing can just explode. There will be so much energy liberated through this process, right? So what you can see, uh, it all goes down. When I get to mitochondria and you're gonna see it, it all goes down to electrons transport chain. Chain means you do it step by step. Okay, you transfer electrons from one substance to another, right? Uh, in order to harness this energy, pretty much. Otherwise, it will be too much energy at once that can really, uh, you know, go in a big explosion. And it compares, for example, to production of water molecule, you take uh, two hydrogen, sorry, you can do, can take two hydrogens and one oxygen or just one hydrogen and half oxygen molecule and produce water. Uh, actually, uh, during this reaction, though, 
so much energy could be released, right? Free energy. Um, in cellular respiration, what you can see, you don't really want this explosion. So there is an electron transport chain, okay? Chain means electrons transfer from one substance to another, another, another. And the one that is on the bottom is the most electronegative, the one that can pull electrons to itself, right? And once you do it step by step, you don't get this big explosion, but you get bits of it in the form of ATP molecules, okay? I should say cellular respiration, to my opinion, is really beautifully and smartly designed um, uh, phenomenon because I don't know like how the cells got this intelligence, right? Um, in terms of controlling this process so beautifully. Okay, guys, talk to me. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Yes, I know. Those on the front, it's like, uh, you know, on Zoom, those that I see here is like a sitting in the front row in the class. <laughs> then the middle, and this are the very, very last <laughs> row that I'm not sure exactly uh, whether you're with me or not. Okay. Okay, so um, now let's uh, get to the cellular respiration and this is a preview. So cellular respiration actually uh, includes three processes, three parts. The beginning is called glyco <clears throat> glycolysis. Then, then there is a citric acid cycle. And the last one is called oxidative phosphorylation. So uh, glycolysis. Glyco is glucose, lysis means breaking down. So glycolysis basically literally means breaking down glucose. But it can break down glucose in just one step, right? So it's the first step when you take a six carbon molecule and break it into two, three carbon molecules. Then um, the product of glycolysis called uh, pyruvic acid or pyruvate, Pyruvate means it's a charged molecule. This one enters the citric acid cycle, which actually continues with the breakdown of glucose. And it's also some electrons could be harvested during citric acid cycle. And the last step is oxidative phosphorylation. Phosphorylation uh, can hint you about ATP because ATP has three phosphates, right? And uh, phosphorylation is literally means synthesis of ATP from ADP molecule. Remember, once you break down ATP to ADP, that's when the energy is released, right? Now you have ADP, you want to, through phosphorylation, you want to get ATP, okay? What is uh, chemiosmosis? It's a very interesting, beautiful process we're going to get down to it soon. Okay, so three parts, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Now, uh, in terms of location, glycolysis can take place, it takes place actually in their uh, cytosol. And glycolysis doesn't require oxygen, so the first step. Once glycolysis is over, it continues inside the mitochondria. So in mitochondria, you have these two parts, the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. During this process, again, there are, um, it's, it's literally biochemistry and you're gonna see so many different names. I'll be more specific in terms of what names are really important. Uh, for us at this point, and what names you don't really have to uh, memorize. So let's uh, take a look at the overview. Overview, overview of, of cellular respiration. 
Organic compounds, such as glucose, store energy in their arrangements of atoms. These molecules are broken down and their energy extracted in cellular respiration. The first stage of cellular respiration occurs in the cytosol, while the second and third stages occur in mitochondria. In cellular respiration, electrons are transferred from glucose to electron carriers such as NAD+, and finally to oxygen. The energy released by this transfer of electrons is used to make ATP. Carbon dioxide and water are given off as byproducts. Let's learn about the stages of cellular respiration. Glycolysis is a series of steps in which a glucose molecule is broken down into two molecules of pyruvate. As the chemical bonds in glucose are broken, electrons and hydrogen ions are picked up by NAD+, forming NADH. Glucose is oxidized and NAD+, is reduced. A small amount of ATP is also produced in glycolysis by substrate-level phosphorylation but most of the energy released by the breakdown of glucose is carried by the electrons attached to NADH. The pyruvate molecules are oxidized to acetyl-CoA as they enter the mitochondrion, releasing carbon dioxide. The acetyl-CoA molecules enter a series of reactions called the citric acid cycle. More carbon dioxide is released as the citric acid cycle completes the oxidation of glucose. In the citric acid cycle, a small amount of ATP is formed by substrate-level phosphorylation, but most of the energy released by the oxidation of glucose is carried by NADH and FADH2. In oxidative phosphorylation, the final stage of cellular respiration, the NADH and FADH2 molecules produced in glycolysis and the citric acid cycle donate their electrons to the electron transport chain electrons move down the chain to the end, where oxygen exerts a strong pull on the electrons. Oxygen, electrons, and hydrogen ions combine, forming water. The electron transport chain converts the chemical energy from moving electrons to a form of energy that can be used to drive oxidative phosphorylation, which produces most of the ATP generated by cellular respiration. Okay, um, now now we're going to handle it step by step, okay? But big picture, big picture, you have complex molecule, right? Not complex. It's a large molecule of glucose that has 12 uh, hydrogens, right? So each hydrogen is actually electron and proton, right? One electron, one proton. So the whole idea is through this first two initial stages, pick up this electrons along with the protons, right? Move them into the electron chain reaction, right? And by actually transferring them from one substance to another, yield energy to generate ATP, okay? So the whole idea, the whole idea, you need molecule with hydrogens because hydrogens are electrons, right? and protons on with that. You pick them up, you start transferring them to the most electronegative substance, which is oxygen, right? And you collect energy through this process in order to produce ATP. Yeah, guys, you with me? Are you with me? I have a question, Professor. Yes. Uh, when I was in high school, and we learned about this, we called the citric acid cycle the Krebs cycle. Is there a difference or is no, it just No, no, it's Krebs names? cycle. It's actually was a, a German scientist, uh, uh, Johann Krebs, right? Who actually described it. Uh, unfortunately, he had to leave Germany in 30s. Uh, he had to, he was uh, offered position in uh, England as a scientist, biochemist. And uh, he was the first one to describe the citric acid cycle that in many places, and when I learned, we also called it Krebs cycle, wild citric acid cycle, right? And uh, he founded our research institute actually there, that it's still, uh, still there uh, and still uh, has its name. But I think in nowadays it's like two names, citric cycle and Krebs cycle. What is the same one? Mm -hmm. Okay, 
And uh, basically, uh, the electron transfer chain reactions, they, the last step, they generate most of the ATP there, right? Um, ATP, why not 100%? Because some ATP is produced initially in initial stages as well um, in substrate level phosphorylation, which means that you take phosphate group right from one molecule and you transfer it to ADP to produce ATP. That's called substrate level phosphorylation. Okay. So you can see this is the enzyme. It picks up phosphate group, ADP, and here you go. This is the former substrate and the ATP. Okay, that's called substrate level phosphorylation, just transferring phosphate group from substrate to ADP. Okay, and I really like this analogy actually, um, the money analogy. So you go to the bank, right? And you get, let's say, uh, $100 bill. This is the glucose. But $100 bill might not be really handy in, uh, you know, in some errands, right? So you want to cash it, right? You cash it to, let's say, $1 bill, $5 bill, $10 bills, right? This is something like you can be analogy to ATP. So cellular respiration, you go from big, big bill, right? Large bill to a smaller, okay? Like cashing it to um, something that might be more handy. And we're gonna get back to this later on. And uh, let's get to the first step, which is glycolysis, breaking down glucose. Um, I just want to remind you that glucose um, enters the cells, right, with the help of hormone called insulin. And it goes through a facilitated diffusion. Remember facilitated diffusion? Who can tell me what is facilitated diffusion? Eyes. Ah, I don't want to mess up. Isn't it like um, it, it's a passive uh, type of transport? It's know? a passive transport, Jamarius. Awesome. Keep talking. Oh. <laughs> You're on the right track. Um, and I, I don't, I don't know. I'm getting kind of nervous now. Um, Why? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Gabriel, do you remember what facilitated diffusion? No, I think it's something related to diffusion, maybe. <laughs> no. Of course, it's related to diffusion. Oh, it is? Okay. It's facilitated diffusion. It's a form of diffusion. Remember, I said that some substances can cross membrane the way they are, right? Like oxygen can just pass through the phospholipid by layer. Some can cross there by layer. So what do they need? They need the... Um the proteins that are in the membrane. Exactly. They need special proteins, right? They need either channels or carriers. In case of glucose, they need a special carriers, right? And uh, it's like um, it's like you have, uh, for example, a lot of people outside, they want to enter, but the door is closed, right? Once you open the doors, people can enter, they can move, right? So that's about glucose facilitated diffusion. For the glucose to enter inside the cell, you have to insert their carriers, right? And it's pretty much powered by hormone insulin. Now, once glucose enters, it has to stay inside the cell, right? It has to stay inside the cell uh, to be engaged in the process of cellular respiration. Um, so first thing that happens to glucose once it enters the cell, and it's also considered beginning of glycolysis, is it gets phosphorylated. Phosphorylated, their phosphate group is added to glucose molecules, 
right? Um, and ATP is used for this process, okay? So that's called energy investment phase. Investment phase when two ATPs are used for glucose phosphorylation, okay? And then there is their energy payoff, actually. Um, the energy payoff is once glucose is broken down to two pyruvate molecules and two water molecules, um, two ATP, basically four ATP molecules formed, but because two were wasted, so the total yield will be two ATP molecules and also an ADH will harvest electrons, okay? So actually, actually, what you can see that the very first step of cellular restoration on its own can generate ATP. But again, the yield is very, very low, right? You use two and you gain four, so the net is two. So let's take a look here. Glycolysis, which begins the breakdown of glucose, is a series of 10 enzyme-catalyzed chemical reactions that can be divided into two main phases. In the energy investment phase, some ATP energy is used to start the process of glucose oxidation. By the end of this phase, a six-carbon molecule, glucose, has been split into two three-carbon molecules of glyceraldehyde phosphate. The three carbon glyceraldehyde phosphate molecules now enter the energy payoff phase. Chemical bonds are broken and NAD plus picks up electrons and hydrogen ions forming NADH. The energy released is used to attach phosphate groups. The phosphates are transferred to ADP, finally making some ATP. This way of making ATP is called substrate level phosphorylation. A couple more reactions rearrange the atoms in the three carbon molecules. More ATP is generated in the final reaction that yields pyruvate. For each glucose molecule broken down during glycolysis, a net of two ATPs are formed along with two NADH molecules. Okay, so bottom line, you had glucose, which is six carbons, right? And is broken down into two pyruvic acid or pyruvate. Again, pyruvic acid is a molecule. Pyruvate is a charged uh, molecule after losing a uh, proton. Um, sorry, after picking up electron, sorry. Uh, pyruvate is a negatively charged molecule, sorry. So you get two pyruvates, which are three carbon chain, right? Uh, that could be still very, very useful molecules to continue into their uh, respiration process to yield ATP, right? So bottom line, you break it down to three carbon molecules, produce net total gain is two ATPs and two NADH. So you get some electrons and you get already some ATP, which is the initial step of cellular respiration. Okay, so, and as I mentioned, uh, gluc oxygen is crucial, right? Oxygen is crucial to continue. If there's no oxygen, that's gonna be the end of the story, pretty much, okay? Now, this is uh, something that you don't really have to worry about, right? It's uh, phosphorylation, right? Initial phosphorylation step, and then you get this intermediate uh, three carbon molecules, right? And they continue on with the harvesting electrons, ATP productions, and then you get to see two pyruvates. Pyruvate means negative charge on their oxygen. Don't worry about this intermediate molecules, just no glucose, pyruvate, and the yield. Let's take a look at this one. Let's take a closer look at how ATP is produced from a molecule of glucose, our fuel. Only the carbon skeleton is shown to keep things simple. The first step is called glycolysis, and it takes place outside the mitochondria. To begin the process, some energy has to be invested. Next, the molecule is split in half. 
Now, the molecule NAD+, an electron carrier, picks up electrons and hydrogen atoms from the carbon molecule, becoming NADH. Keep track of the electron carriers. They play an important role by transporting electrons to reactions in the mitochondria. In the final steps of glycolysis, some ATP is produced, but not much. For every glucose molecule, only two net ATPs are produced outside the mitochondrion. However, glycolysis has produced pyruvic acid, which still has a lot of energy available. Okay. Um, any questions here? Talk to me, guys. So, can you explain the process again? It like um, as we glycolysis. Said, it's like, yes. So there's a glucose molecule, and then um, it breaks in half with two ATP on it. Here, Jamaris, we'll be happy to. Okay. So, um, basically, one more time, glucose is a six carbon molecule, right? Six. Um. What is attached to the carbon? Mostly hydrogen, right? So remember hydrogen means one proton, one electron. It's very, very easy just to pick this electrons. Not easy, I mean, <laughs> but again, the whole logic is you're picking up this electrons from there with a the hydrogen, right? So this is called the electron transfer, right? You pick them up and um, the molecule that picks them up is an AD plus, right? It can pick up electron and proton from the hydrogen. Okay, so basically the initial step is to break down glucose into two short molecules, harvest electrons, right? And also ATP production, not much. You can produce much more ATP when oxygen is present. That's why you have to continue the process inside the mitochondria. But initial, initial step of cellular respiration for that is called glycolysis. Again, you break down glucose, you harvest electrons, and you produce some ATP. Does it make more sense now, Jamarius? Yes, it makes more sense. Okay. Um, again, keep in mind, Six, right? Six. You can go all the way down, right, to CO2, carbon dioxide. For this, you need mitochondria. But in the cytosol where glycolysis takes place, you can't go without oxygen that far, right? You actually go only down to three carbon molecules, which is a pyruvic acid or pyruvate, okay? So pyruvate, you're going to see later on, is a very, very useful molecule. Actually, if glycolysis stops here, you can still uh, do interesting things with a pyruvate as well. OK, guys, so listen. Um, few words about their, um, few words about their uh, citric acid cycle. Um, it's basically, with, no, we're going to talk about pyruvate oxidation and then we take a break, okay? A little bit more. So, um, so you get pyruvate, which is, again, it's a negatively charged molecule, right? And this one can move inside the mitochondria, right? Uh, in prokaryotes that don't have mitochondria, it continues in the cytosol, right? And the first thing that's gonna happen to the pyruvate is actually gonna turn to another molecule called acetyl coenzyme A, okay, or acetyl CoA. So, um, enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase, right? can conduct three reactions, okay? It can actually um, oxidize. Oxidize, remember, um, removing electrons, right? And during the oxidation, the first CO2 molecule will be released. Reduction, 
picking up electrons again to another NADH, NAD plus molecule. And then picking up this fragment uh, and turn coenzyme A to acetyl coenzyme A. So let's take a look here. This is dehydrogenase. Okay, so here's the summary. You have the pyruvate, right? Pyruvate enters mitochondria and look, three, right? Three. So first thing gonna happen, this CO2 will be chopped off, right? Chopped, and CO2 is released. While this happens, electrons will be harvested. Electrons will be picked up. Now, this is chopped, but uh, instead, this group will be added, converted pyruvase into acetyl coenzyme A, okay? So this group is removed and this um, group is added, okay? So acetyl coenzyme A is actually the molecule that will enter the citric acid cycle. So let's take a look at this video and then we'll continue after the break. Let's follow this pyruvic acid molecule into a mitochondrion to see where most of the energy is extracted. As the molecule enters the mitochondrion, one carbon is removed, forming carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Electrons are stripped, forming NADH. Coenzyme A attaches to the two-carbon fragment, forming acetyl-CoA. Okay, so acetyl-CoA is the one that will move on forward, okay, into their citric acid cycle. Okay, guys, so it's 9.09. Um, I'll say 10 minutes, so I'll see you in the um, recording, and I'll share the screen. Okay, so where we stopped? We stopped uh, at the point when you got the pyruvate, right? So pyruvate, which is a three carbon negatively charged molecule, right? Uh, has to enter their cycle, the citric acid or Krebs cycle. Now, it can enter the Krebs cycle the way it is, right? Once it's inside mitochondria, it has to be converted to another molecule called acetyl coenzyme A, okay? Don't really worry about uh, why. I mean, it has serves its purpose. And uh, during this actual transformation, uh, another electrons picked up along the way, along the road, okay? So now you have acetyl coenzyme A. And uh, citric acid cycle takes place inside the mitochondria. And what you can see, you can see that it enters the cycle as is acetyl coenzyme A. And when the cycle makes a full, full turn, it gives two carbon dioxide molecules, electrons, and an ADH plus carrier picks them up. More electrons, another carrier called FADH. This is another carrier, another NADH carrier, and you also get ATP molecule, okay? So basically, basically, you need the whole cycle, you need the whole cycle pretty much for harvesting electrons. Okay. So, so far what we talked about, I should say CO2 production is a byproduct. ATP is a good thing, but the yield is not that great. But all these chemical reactions, they really mattered for electron harvest, okay? The oxidation of glucose continues in the citric acid cycle. Pyruvate molecules formed during glycolysis are transported from the cytosol into the mitochondrion, but pyruvate itself does not enter the citric acid cycle. A reaction occurs that removes a carbon atom, releasing it in carbon dioxide. Electrons are transferred to an NADH molecule storing energy. Coenzyme A, or CoA, joins with the two carbon fragment forming acetyl-CoA. 
one molecule of acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle. The two-carbon fragment of acetyl-CoA attaches to the four-carbon molecule oxaloacetic cycle. This forms citrate. In a series of steps, bonds break and reform. Two carbon atoms are released, one at a time, in molecules of carbon dioxide. Electrons are carried off by molecules of NADH and FADH2. One step produces an ATP molecule by substrate level phosphorylation. The four carbon oxaloacetate molecule is regenerated. Since two acetyl-CoA molecules are produced for each glucose molecule broken down, a second acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle. The same series of reactions occurs, releasing carbon dioxide and producing more NADH, FADH2, and ATP. The cell has gained two ATPs that can be used. Sorry. ...directly. However, most of the energy originally contained in the bonds of glucose is now carried by the NADH and FADH2 molecules. Okay. So, um, now, this is a crazy, crazy cycle, right? Uh, what I want to pay attention to, I want you to pay attention to this molecule called oxaloacetate. You don't really have to remember its name, but just pay attention. Oxaloacetate is a, a one, two, three, uh, basically it's a four carbon molecule, right? It's a four carbon molecule. And uh, once it binds coenzyme A, right? Acetyl coenzyme A, sorry, right? It actually grows to six carbon molecule, right? So this six carbon molecule will be transformed. All the transformations, basically, the only purpose of all these transformations is just to harvest electrons, right? Because what you can see along the road, it's gonna get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, and then you get oxaloacetate and another acetyl coenzyme A, okay? So why it's called the Krebs cycle? Because that's where you start, right? That's where you start by combining with acetyl coenzyme A, and that's where you end by the end of the cycle, right? As you follow, can you believe when I was a student, biology program, right? I had to memorize all these molecules, all of them. Um, I probably did, I think so, because I passed the test <laughs> now. I don't remember even one of them. Uh, okay, citrate, it's, it's easy, right? But seriously, uh, none of them. Um, anyways, that's why I don't think there is, a, there is a need. All I want you just to know from this citric acid cycle is that when it starts, right? It starts by combining two molecules and then through the series of electron transfers, right? You end up with the same simple molecule, okay? Um, all matters, all matters here, this NADH, NADH, FADH, NADH. That's all matters because that's where electrons are collected, okay? Um, it's, I think it's like, uh, you know, in these games, you know, in these computer games where it's just goes and jumps and collects coins, yeah, like I think like Mario Bros, like all these games, yeah, <laughs> it's something like that. I think it's like a good analogy, like collecting these coins, which is like actually electrons, okay? Um, so let's take a look at this one. Coenzyme A is removed and the remaining two carbon skeleton is attached to an existing four carbon molecule that serves as the starting point for the citric acid cycle. The new six carbon chain is partially broken down, releasing carbon dioxide. Several electrons are captured by electron carriers and more carbon dioxide is released. The carbon dioxide that you exhale comes from the reactions of cellular respiration. 
Two ATPs are produced by the citric acid cycle for each molecule of glucose. At this point, only a small number of ATPs have been produced. However, more energy is available in the electrons that are being transported by electron carriers. While the citric acid cycle starts another round, let's follow an electron carrier to the next step in the process. Okay. I really like how they do this animation for electron carriers, right? It looks like, like I don't know, like a suitcase, right? With electrons. So, so far, uh, we concluded the initial steps where to kind of like breaking glucose molecule apart. And while you break this glucose molecule apart, you get this electrons that useful for the last step, okay? And the last step, as I said, NADH, FADH, carry electrons further on into the mitochondria, right? And that will be used for the ATP synthesis. Okay, so electron transport chain. What is electron transport chain is, I just want to show you the picture and then I'll go back. Inside the mitochondria, right inside the mitochondria where you can see bunch of proteins these proteins some of them they have fixed location uh inside the mitochondria crystal like the folds uh or the matrix right some of them don't have a fixed location they kind of float but pay attention this is the beginning and this is the end right what is the end oxygen so oxygen is the last acceptor of electrons, right? So what's gonna happen in this chain is electrons will be literally kicked, like passing like a ball from one player to another, right? Passing down, 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 down. What's the whole idea of passing them down? When you pass them down, you get energy. Remember, when electron goes from one molecule to another, energy is produced. Okay, so this is the whole idea about collecting electrons initially in initial steps of cellular respiration, only to pass them down. By the end of the road, will be passed down to oxygen. Oxygen will pick up electrons in hydrogen uh, protons and turn to water. You can't really imagine like, you know, we have a bunch of players and they kick the ball, but imagine like you have a row of players. One is like from the tallest to the shortest, right? It's really easy to throw something down, right? To throw the ball, not up, but down. Again, it goes down and while it goes down, you get energy. Rihanna, does it make sense to you? Yes. It does, yeah. Awesome, awesome. So as I said, you get a bunch of electrons and electrons go down through molecules called cytochromes. Uh, a lot of them have iron. Why iron? Because oxygen tends to buy to iron very, very easily. Okay. And uh, we don't really have to know the details exactly how it happens, right? But as I said, once electrons eventually go down to oxygen, a lot of energy is produced. Now, a really interesting thing, what this energy is for? And this is, I believe, the most, the most interesting part of the whole, uh, of the whole story. Okay. Um, let me show you. In there, Mitochondria, you see, this is the mitochondrial matrix. This is intermembrane space inside the mitochondria. There's an enzyme. And the enzyme, the one that you see here in this picture is called ATP synthase. This enzyme, all it does, it takes ADP and phosphate and produces ATP. Now this enzyme really needs fuel to do so, right? Now, where fuel comes from, and this is the most interesting story here. Listen, 
what happens is that outside, right? Outside the membrane. See, this is there. Like, like there's mitochondria has a set of membranes, but anyways, look at this membrane, right? Outside, inside. Outside the membrane, you have a very high concentration of hydrogen ions, right? This high concentration, right, forms gradient. And this gradient basically makes this hydrogen ions to move in. When hydrogen ions move in, there's only one way for them to move. They move through this part called their uh, rotor, right? So there's like a channel that's basically hydrogen ion forces to go through. When it goes through the channel, the rotor turns. When it turns, it turns this road and catalytic knob, but by the bottom line, hydrogen ions pass through. The energy of the diffusion makes uh, synthase produce ATP. Okay, so so far, you with me? It's clear. Down the road, what do you have? You have their um, enzyme. Enzyme is powered by gradient of hydrogen ions. Are we good at this point? Yeah. Now, remember the beginning of the story. I was telling you about the energy that is released when electrons transferred. What is this energy for? This energy for is to kick hydrogen ions out and produce this gradient. So this gradient can move this enzyme to produce ATP. So let me show you here. And it was a very nice picture. I miss, I think I missed it. But okay, let's go here. Look, this is the chain reaction, right? So this is the chain reaction. Every time electrons passed, right? They passed from one protein to another. You see this red arrow? This is the energy. This energy kicks hydrogen ions out, okay? Against concentration gradient. It kicks hydrogen ion out. They accumulate, move back down the gradient through the ATP synthase. ATP synthase moves and produces ATP. This is the end of the story, guys. Isn't it crazy? Isn't it crazy? Basically, you take glucose, you break it apart, right? You pick up these electrons in a crazy way, right? You bring them down to mitochondria, these electrons. You pass them from one molecule to another. Every time they pass from one molecule to another, this electrons pass, protons kicked out, create concentration gradient that is the energy to power enzyme. This is again, this is uh, pretty much uh, the end of the story, right? So three steps, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and this is the electron chain reaction, okay? So electron chain reaction, electrons you picked up in the earlier steps, pass down to oxygen. Electrons pass down, energy is used to create gradient for protons for hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions can move in down the gradient only through ATP synthase, power it, and ATP is produced. Talk to me, guys. How do you like this story? It was complicated to get easy. It was complicated <laughs> to get easy, right? Isn't it? This is like, this is the crazy part. So what you can say, you breathe oxygen, right? You eat food and you breathe oxygen. So this enzyme can be turned and once it turns, it makes ATP. So it all goes down to protons. It all goes down to gradient of hydrogen ions. Nothing more than that. No, talk to me. I really appreciate Brianna's. Anybody else? 
Leonardo, how do you like the story? Um, it's good. It's just it's gonna take a while to like process it. It's, but I think overall it's interesting though. Yes, it's interesting. Again, just look at the story. You take, you take glucose. Why you take glucose? Because it's easy to remove the hydrogens, right? Each hydrogen is electron and proton, right? Right? You're mm -hmm. gonna need both. You're gonna need both electron and protons. Why do you need oxygen? Because oxygen is the last acceptor of electrons, right? This is the last one down the road with all this uh, electron carriers, right? So you collect these electrons along with the protons. You pass electrons to create proton gradient. And then you use this proton gradient to operate ATP synthase, the enzyme. So once you operate it, it produces ATP. You can put this this way, okay? So what I really want you, I want you to watch uh, the animations. So chemia osmosis is actually creation of gradient of hydrogen ions. So again, you can you have the gradient. When they move down the gradient, they operate this machine. Hydrogen ions flow back across the membrane through a turbine. Much like water through a dam, the flow of hydrogen ions spins the turbine, which activates the production of ATP. These spinning turbines in your cells produce most of the ATP that is generated from the food you eat. Mm -hmm. That's, that's it. I think there's a one more. Most of the energy harvested from organic molecules during glycolysis and the citric acid cycle is stored in NADH and FADH2. These molecules give up their high energy electrons in the third phase of cellular respiration, oxidative phosphorylation, where most of the cell's ATP fuel is produced. The electron transport chain is an array of molecules, mostly proteins, built into the inner membrane of the mitochondria. NADH gives up its high energy electrons to the first complex in the electron transport chain. The electrons move from one member of the chain to the next, giving up their energy as they are pulled from NADH toward highly electronegative oxygen. The energy given up by the flow of electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. Oxygen captures the electrons in the very last step in electron transport. The last complex adds a pair of electrons to an oxygen atom and two hydrogen ions, forming water. The electron transport chain has used the energy of moving electrons to pump hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. This buildup of hydrogen ions, like water behind a dam, stores the potential energy that was originally in the bonds of glucose molecules. The backed up hydrogen ions give up their energy when they diffuse through a special protein in the membrane called ATP synthase. As hydrogen ions flow down their concentration gradient, ATP synthase captures their energy to make ATP. This mode of ATP production is called oxidative phosphorylation because it is powered by the transfer of electrons to oxygen. Okay, so, and the very last one. Electron carriers such as NADH deliver their electrons to an electron transport chain embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. The chain consists of a series of electron carriers, most of which are proteins that exist in large complexes. Electrons are transferred from one electron carrier to the next in the electron transport chain. Let's take a closer look at the path electrons take through the chain. As electrons move along each step of the chain, they give up a bit of energy. The oxygen you breathe pulls electrons from the transport chain, and water is formed as a byproduct. The energy released by electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, creating an area of high hydrogen ion concentration. Hydrogen ions flow back across the membrane through a turbine, 
Much like water through a dam, the flow of hydrogen ions spins the turbine, which activates the production of ATP. These spinning turbines in your cells produce most of the ATP that is generated from the food you eat. The process you've just observed, cellular respiration, generates 10 million ATPs per second in just one cell. That ATP can power a biker up the trail, or it can power your brain cells as you learn challenging biology topics. Mm-hmm. No, that's what I really like. <laughs> it powers your brain. Yes, so true. Now, imagine, imagine um, if something goes wrong with the mitochondria, right? So the whole thing will shut down. Remember I told you uh, that there is a... Mitochondria has its own DNA, right? And if there's a mutation in mitochondrial DNA, what can happen that a uh, child won't be able actually to operate uh, one of their, because you saw there are like a bunch of proteins, right? So mitochondrial DNA is in charge of all these mitochondrial proteins and the whole process will get stuck. Now it makes more sense. Remember when I told you about baby born to three parents? Remember that? Yeah, so remember, if there's mutation in mitochondria, sometimes they do this procedure, right? Uh, because now you understand how crucial this organelle is. Okay. Um, now, the yield is 32 ATPs per one molecule of glucose. I really want you to pay attention to this number, okay? One molecule of glucose gives you 33 ATPs, but in a second, what was the number? Tell me. Did you pay attention to the video? What's the number? 10 million. 10 million per second. Yeah. Okay. So, one more time. All matters. This, 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 this. Right? Electron carriers. Why they matter? They bring electrons to the chain. Electrons go down the chain kick hydrogen out, create gradient to operate the ATPase, okay? Why you need oxygen? You need oxygen as the final acceptor of the electrons. Okay, so guys, uh, the last video, and then we're gonna move to um, the last part, which is fermentation, which is much, much easier. I really want you to watch this video because in this video, it actually also can show what can go wrong? Let's look at the effects of certain factors on ATP yield, beginning with lack of oxygen. When the final electron acceptor is not available to an electron transport chain, the chain shuts down and is unable to continue to pump protons across the membrane. When the proton gradient is removed, ATP synthase can no longer produce ATP. Cyanide poisoning acts in a manner similar to oxygen deprivation. Cyanide blocks cytochrome A3, preventing that complex from reducing oxygen. With cytochrome A3 stuck in the reduced state, the other components of the chain are unable to change to the oxidized state. The proton gradient breaks down and ATP synthesis is halted. Okay, you know cyanide, right? It's a poison. Have you heard about cyanide, guys? Yeah, do you know yes. that? Yes, do you know by the end of the war, right? The Second World War, when, uh, um, you know, Americans, Russians, British, they captured Germany, Berlin, right? All the top of their Nazis, they all had their cyanide available, right? Yeah. So they took cyanide basically to commit suicide. Now you can see how it actually works. Some proteins use the proton gradient for some task other than producing ATP. These proteins are called uncoupling proteins because they uncouple or disconnect the electron transport chain from ATP synthesis. For example, thermogenin is a protein found in certain mammalian fat cells. Thermogenin uses much of the energy of the proton gradient to produce heat to keep the mammal warm, thus reducing the yield of ATP. Okay. 
we done with our cellular respiration. Any questions here? Okay. So um, we talked about aerobic. Aerobic means in presence of oxygen. Now, anaerobic, if oxygen is not available. So first of all, you saw that glycolysis, glycolysis which is anaerobic, can get some ATP, but it's not really much again for our cells. We can really like go on glycolysis for more than a few minutes, remember? Without oxygen, we can survive for more than a few minutes. Um, so what are, but still, this process exists, right? Um, and I also want to show you that some organisms, for example, some bacteria, they don't use oxygen as electron acceptor, the, like the last acceptor, final acceptor. They use sulfate ion and uh, Sulfate eventually binds hydrogen, right? Like oxygen binds hydrogen, sulfate binds, and produces H2S, which is a hydrogen sulfate, super stinky gas, super stinky. So did you ever smell rotten eggs? Yeah, yeah, it, trust me, it's, it's a pretty bad smell. This is, a, this is a bacteria that actually use sulfate instead of oxygen as an electron acceptor, and they produce instead of water hydrogen sulfide. Um, now, um, basically uh, continuing without ATP production, without oxygen is called fermentation, okay? So fermentation is the same idea to regenerate NAD plus, right? And collect electrons and um, two types of fermentation, alcohol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. Bacteria, yeast can do alcohol fermentation. We can produce alcohol by ourselves. Our cells, and it's uh, pretty much the cells that can do this, uh, muscle cells only. Muscle cells produce lactic acid, okay? This is their alternative for, um, aerobic respiration. So alcohol fermentation, remember the pyruvate, pyruvate which is produced uh, through glycolysis, uh, pyruvate actually converted to ethanol, which is alcohol, has two carbons, not one, a CO2, but two carbons, right? And uh, we use you know, this yeast to make beer, to make wine, we also use it for baking, okay? So by the way, uh, when we use the yeast for baking, right? Because they breathe, right? They produce carbon dioxide. And this carbon dioxide is actually responsible for this rising of the bread, okay? So what you can see, glycolysis, pyruvate, and pyruvate eventually converted to ethanol and electrons are harvested through this process, okay? And this electrons used to produce ATP, right? Remember, whenever electrons are picked up, they go for ATP production. Lactic acid fermentation, glycolysis, pyruvate. And I think it's very smart that Actually, mammals don't produce alcohol. Alcohol, uh, your cells, it, alcohol is toxic to your cells. It's really, really toxic. As much as you might like actually alcohol, your cells don't really appreciate it, especially brain cells. Okay, so to get pyruvate and uh, again, electrons, the same idea, but instead of ethanol, you get lactate. Now, lactate. It's like one side by side. You can see they're uh, quite similar. No, not even similar. Ethanol is two carbons. Lactate is actually three carbons. Um, now, lactate um, is usually produced by, uh, as I said, muscle cells. When your muscles are running out of fuel. What's special about your muscle cells, guys? Your muscle cells can store oxygen, 
Um, normally, your cells don't store oxygen. Oxygen has to be all the time supplied. But in muscles, there is a protein called myoglobin that can store oxygen. But this storage could be depleted easily um, when, you know, any like any physical exercise, right? So for example, you go to work out, you, you're running or you biking, right? And especially if your muscle cells are not conditioned, what does it mean not conditioned? They're not really used to this effort. You can deplete this oxygen storage very fast. Oxygen is out, fermentation lactic acid fermentation, right? Muscles get tired and uh, lactic acid for very long time was blamed actually for the soreness, right? You know what I'm talking about, yeah? The muscles get sore. Yeah. Now it says that it's not the lactic acid because it's acid, right? Acid, it burns. Is that that there's actually damage to the muscles during the strenuous exercise, which I actually doubt. I think that, I think lactic acid, they call it like, they call it their, uh, the muscle juice, right? The juice that actually makes change to your muscles, right? Um, but anyways, um, it's three carbons. It could be easily, easily, uh, restored to glucose, right? And could be reused. So let's take a look at this. All cells are able to synthesize ATP via the process of glycolysis. In many cells, if oxygen is not present, pyruvate, pyruvic acid is metabolized in a process called fermentation. By oxidizing the NADH produced in glycolysis, fermentation regenerates NAD+, which can take part in glycolysis once again to produce more ATP. The net energy gain in fermentation is two ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. Fermentation complements glycolysis and makes it possible for ATP to be continually produced in the absence of oxygen. Two common types of fermentation are described here. Alcohol fermentation, which occurs in yeast, results in the production of ethanol and carbon dioxide. Lactic acid fermentation, which occurs in muscle, results in the production of lactate, lactic acid. Let's see the relationship between glycolysis and alcohol fermentation. Glycolysis produces NADH, ATP, and pyruvate, pyruvic acid. If oxygen is not present, NADH cannot be oxidized in the electron transport chain. Without fermentation, the cell would run out of NAD+, bringing glycolysis to a halt. In alcohol fermentation, the pyruvate, pyruvic acid from glycolysis, loses one carbon in the form of carbon dioxide, and the product is then reduced to ethanol by NADH. With the formation of ethanol, NADH is oxidized and becomes NAD+. With a continuous supply of NAD+, glycolysis can continue producing more ATP. Okay. And by the way, fermentation is a crucial process in making chocolate, believe it or not. Okay. It doesn't have alcohol, but is a actually by like how to say side side product of fermentation. Okay, and this is about the muscles, and this is about fermentation again. Bottom line, fermentation gives you much less ATP. It still gives you. You can run on lactic acid for too long, right? Anyways, uh, but it's like a backup, um, backup story. Okay, and uh, the last few things. I want you to pay attention. Anaerobes, they don't use oxygen, right? For cellular respiration. Obligate anaerobes, they can't carry fermentation, right? Basically, they can't survive in the presence of oxygen. 
uh, let me give you an example. Um, there is a horrible bacteria called Clostridia. If this Clostridia actually infects wound, it can cause gangrene. Have you heard about gangrene? Uh, yes, I've heard of it. Yes, gangrene. Oh, this is a. This is one. Gangrene was. It is still. It's a number one reason for amputation. Because once gangrene starts, it causes destruction of tissue, called necrosis, death of tissue, and basically once tissue is dead, there is no way uh, to restore. And uh, for example, during uh, the wartime, soldiers, most of the soldiers, they were use, losing their limbs because of the wounds getting infected with clostridia and clostridia is causing gas gangrene. Horrible, it's like, you know, the tissue turns black with a horrible like boils on it. it smells horrible also. Now, clostridia is obligate on aerobes. It can survive in the presence of oxygen. So one of the treatments actually was to, uh, didn't help much, but it was attempt at least, uh, to put this part of the body, limb, inside their oxygen saturated chamber. So that was like our treatment because this bacteria, they couldn't survive in presence of oxygen, right? And if you saturate it with oxygen, you could actually get rid of them. Maybe at initial stages, it probably worked, but in the advanced stages of a gangrene, no way. So obligate means no oxygen. Yeast and bacteria could be facultative anaerobes. Facultative anaerobes, they can switch. So they can survive in both presence and absence of oxygen, okay? And pyruvate is a fork. I mean, it's a very crucial molecule because it can actually take them either way into cellular respiration or into fermentation. Okay, so pyruvate is a crossroad, right? Either fermentation or mitochondria. So glycolysis is a very important, it's super significant because due to glycolysis, actually um, it's not about ATP, it's about oxygen, right? So the first bacteria that carried out glycolysis, right? Produced oxygen and uh, became basically the life became possible due to accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere. And the last one, the last one, I just concentrate on this diagram. It's a very important diagram. If you're gonna continue into anatomy, and I guess many of you will continue taking anatomy class, right? You're gonna talk about this. I think an AMP2, okay? So pay attention. Glucose, right? You can get glucose whenever you eat carbs, right? And remember, for us, number one source of carbs is what? D1, can you answer that question? What is the major source of carbs in our diet? Isn't it like sugary products, like um, like carbs are sugar, right? In a sense, mm, sugar is a. Uh... No, I mean like it's a sugary, like it creates like a sugary substance. So I'm guessing like the breakdown of like, like usually people say carbs are like bread, rice. You find it in like those type of food. Um, good carbs, bad carbs, you know, bad carbs are from like, I think potato chips, I guess. Yes. Can you name, can you name them? Like, what is this complex carb that is present in bread? How we call it? Um, the complex carb. Um, let's see. It starts with letter S. Starch. No. Yeah. Starch. Yes. Starch, right. 
that's how we take carbs in, right? But, I mean, we don't really eat uh, like uh, sugar, sugar. I mean, you don't go and like, uh, I mean, we can put sugar into coffee, into tea, right? But in our diet, we don't really leave off uh, table sugar, right? We don't. In our diet, it could be rice, it could be bread, it could be potatoes. Yep. Starch. So, bottom line, you get glucose from starch. Um, then it goes, enters the glycolysis, right? And you get the pyruvate. Is it the right one? This, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, this one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Carbs, sugars, glucose. Now, um, if you run out of glucose, no glucose available, like you on keto diet. I'm sure you heard about keto diet, right? Yes, guys. You on keto diet, so in keto diet, you hope to break down fats, right? You can. So what fats can give you in case you don't eat starch? It can give you glycerol, which is the part of their triglyceride molecule. And gliss glycerol can be our halfway through product in glycolysis. So you see, uh, glycerol, the high three, it's actually, you know, halfway between glucose and pyruvate. So glycerol can actually substitute this molecule and continue into cellular respiration, right? Fatty acids, you break down fatty acids. Fatty acids can give you glucose, no matter what, but they can give you acetylcholine A, right? It can also enter the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. That's what I'm showing you. If you are not consuming carbs, right? What are the other options? What about proteins? Now on proteins, there's amino group, right? NH2 group. You remove it, it's called deamination. And by deamination, you actually produce ammonia that has to be removed. Ammonia is very toxic, but anyways, sorry. Amino acids can enter cellular respiration through transformation. They have to be transformed, but they can enter as a pyruvate. They can enter as a glucose itself, transformed amino acid, or they can enter as acetylcholine A. Okay. So what I'm just showing you that the glycolysis is a very, very important uh, part because in glycolysis, you can substitute glucose by metabolizing through metabolism of other molecules as well, right? So that's how you, actually, if you don't eat, why you waste away? You waste away because of the proteins, right? Proteins enter glycolysis, right? You lose them as a muscle mass, right? You lose weight. Fats, you burn fats. Why you lose weight? Because fats could be utilized here or here, right? As an energy. Questions? Talk to me, people. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it an interesting story? I hope like I share it with you that it's actually something something um you i hope you can relate to yourself at least here right i mean yeah this relates to all of us yeah I mean, that happens internally like we eat food we all eat and this is something that happens to all of us maybe not the um losing fat part but like the the creating energy and in order to like survive that happens no, I don't know if you heard that. If you exercise, right? If you exercise, it's not easy to lose weight, right? Oh, yeah. Can okay. anyone elaborate? Why? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Like when you exercise, I mean, you can lose weight, but it's you really have to watch what you eat. Can you elaborate from this diagram? Why so? Isn't exercising is mainly for um, 
I want to say working out the muscle, not really burning the fat. I want to say it's it's, so, it's more of like building up lactic acid, which like kind of tears muscle, and you build it up with protein, but it doesn't really burn the fat. And so, like to, in order to burn the fat, it's like a combination of working out and also um, watching what you eat because you know the more you intake, the more um, extra leftovers you have, which turns into fat, like you said before in our previous lesson. Yeah, I think, yes, you got the point, right? So when you exercise, you burn fat, right? You do burn fat. But at the same time, you build proteins. So kind of like balances, right? It's really hard to go down on your weight because yes, you get rid of this, but at the same time, you build this. It depends on, definitely on the type of the exercise, right? Like if you lift weights, that's definitely, this is the way where you go, right? Um, but let's say uh, aerobic exercise, when you actually mostly like burn calories rather than you build muscles, can actually be more helpful in losing weight. Uh, professor, um, I just wanna clarify something because um, a trainer once told me that when we're burning, when we're exercising, right, we tend to burn what we eat first and then we hit our fats and like, you know, the stored fats. So if a person is exercising just for like a small amount of time, right, let's say our daily exercises, let's say the person's doing 45 and then you, depending on the exercise you're doing, like let's say you're doing treadmill, he says you don't burn a lot of fat that way. You're just like, working out it's not a effective way that's what he told me I don't know but um it's like you burn the fat I mean you burn what you're eating right now so you get hungry and you don't target that fat that's stored away or like the sugar you know the extra body fat um and then you eat again so technically you don't lose weight like that that's true right like you uh, target the food that you eat so how does that tie in with like the gain of protein and like loss of fat, how would you say, I think I'm confusing my question. Let me just fix my question. Oh, I am, I totally get your question because I actually asked this question myself so many times. Yeah. So, yes, basically what they say, they say that when you go to the gym, right? Especially if you do aerobic exercise, um, like cardio, uh, not resistance, right? You like on treadmill or you are in the bike, right? It, they say that whatever you eat, right, before, let's say you had your breakfast and you had carbs in your breakfast, right? So your body gonna tend actually to use them first, right? So you're gonna just burn your breakfast and then they say, okay, like after 30, 40 minutes, after you burn your breakfast, you're gonna start actually burning fats for energy as well, right? Now, you burn your fat, you got hungry after exercise, and whatever you lost, you're going to gain right away once you eat. Now, I honestly, it doesn't work this way for everyone. I mean, there is some logic behind that, but trust me, uh, it doesn't mean that if you go to gym, you have to work out at least 45 minutes if you want to burn something. That's not true. Absolutely not true. Okay. It really depends on your diet, what you eat. And it really depends um, how consistent you are, right? If you work out at least 30 minutes a day, it still counts. It still counts for burning calories. It still counts for like, you know, changing your body. Okay, the key, the key, I will always say is a diet. Exercise can do a lot to you, right? But if you want to lose weight, bottom line, that's about what you eat. I can tell you from my personal experience, you know, when we went into this lockdown, right? And I uh, realized I'm staying home, like I'm not going to work anymore. I mean, I work, but I work from home. I'm not leaving uh, the house much, right? Because uh, at the beginning, we all, you know, had to stay inside, right? 
I thought, okay, I can find at least 30 minutes a day to exercise, right? Whatever. I have weights, I have phone with YouTube, I have TV, I can pick up whatever I like to do. And I like mostly, I like actually uh, like resistance rather than aerobic, but combination, right? So I started religiously six times a week. And what happened to me? I put on 12 pounds in a flash. I was shocked, honestly. I was like, I know it was like, yeah, it was like real shock. So I realized I have to do something about that. So I made an appointment. It was definitely a virtual appointment with a dietitian. So, and I told her, and I started to tell her, oh, that's my hormones, this and that and that. And she said, stop, <laughs> listen. <laughs> She said, cut the carbs in the afternoon. She said, you want to eat bread? Eat bread, eat cookie. Morning, you want fruits? Till 4 p.m. you can eat fruits, right? After lunch, uh, you all you can eat, you can eat some like snack, like nuts, okay? And for dinner, only proteins and veggies and it's, it's it worked surprisingly you know since like uh you know since then uh, um it's not like dramatic but at least i lost this 12 pounds that i gained right so what i'm just saying that exercise is super important but it's not about like exercising for a certain period of time, for a certain amount of time. Exercise is important for the sake of exercise for your overall health. But if you want to control your weight, it's just through the diet. Okay? Okay, guys, I'm done with the, <clears throat> with the lecture. Any questions? <clears throat> 